On today's Prophecy in the News, we're going to take you back to our March 2002 magazine for the beginning of a series of articles we call Amazing Discoveries. And uh, Gary Sherman and I are going to share with you some of the discoveries that we have found over the years and um, which we feel are quite unusual. The first one comes from John chapter 19. Gary? John 19, of course, uh, we're talking here about the burial uh, and resurrection of Christ in John 19 and uh, 20. <clears throat> and we have uh, the fact, uh, I think this is one of the most famous historical facts in all the world. Uh, Pilate, John 19, 19, a Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross and the writing was Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. I don't suppose there's anyone, Christian or not, who doesn't know that story. And, and by the way, regard it as real history and not just mythology because uh, why would you put, why would you insert this into the Bible, uh, this story of Pilate writing a sign and having it put over Jesus' head? Yeah. Now, Dr. Alan Wanger of Duke University writes, Helena, the mother of Constantine the Great, went to Jerusalem in the early fourth century to search for the holy places. She reportedly found the tomb with objects in it, including the title board, the titulus, with the words, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, in three languages. She divided the board, sending one to Constantinople and taking the other to Rome, where it presently resides in the Basilica of the Holy Cross in Jerusalem. Now, here's the fascinating discovery. In studying the Shroud of Turin, Dr. Alan Wanger found along the side, uh, uh, parallel with the left leg of the crucified man in the shroud, the lettering from the title board. And uh, we have a picture of it here in our magazine. And Gary, the fascinating thing is not only does it spell out uh, some of the lettering that is found from the title mm -hmm. board, but comparing it with the title board in Rome, the very style of the lettering fits perfectly. It's exactly the same lettering, which suggests, and Dr. Alan Wanger is to be commended for his ongoing uh, shroud research. Uh, he is, by the way, with Duke University. The interesting thing about it is the, the uh, body of Jesus appears to have been accompanied by a number of articles, uh, shadows of which appear on the shroud, flower outlines, uh, many of the flowers identifiable as native to the Holy Land, uh, and this, the lettering on this sign, which we have in our Prophecy in the News magazine, you can actually see the lettering, and in addition to this, two pieces of cloth, not only the shroud, but what's called the sudarion, uh, the head wrapping, which is described in John 20, uh, verse 7, the napkin which was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself, discovered by Peter and John. So, J.R., as we discover uh, and look and look, it, it's, it's not just the shroud we're talking about, it's the accompanying relics that, that, that uh, apparently followers of Jesus felt were uh, necessary to be interred with him. There are many things about the shroud that are absolutely fascinating, but this one in particular, that the very lettering from the title board appears on the shroud. Now, there are people who have called him the man in the shroud. Well, I want you to know <laughs> that the Shroud of Turin finally names the crucified man. Yes. Fascinating. And you can actually see, by the way, the word, a part of the Greek word Nazarene, Jesus, as in Jesus of Nazareth, in yes. the Greek. Now, we go down below Jerusalem to a little place that was a lime uh, pit, uh, and the discovery of snake uh, remains, mm -hmm. fossilized remains of a snake with legs. After the fall of Adam and Eve, God cursed the snake, saying, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, above every beast of the field, upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Genesis 3.14. Well, such an, a statement implies that the condition of the snake before the fall showed that he was able to walk, that he had legs. Mm -hmm. And Gary, 
this, um, this strange find in 1979 proves that snakes once had legs. There is a stone quarry uh, about 12 miles north of Jerusalem uh, where a snake fossil was found with extremely clear leg bones, four legs. We have a photograph of one of those legs in our magazine. And J.R., the, the, uh, according to the uh, archaeologists and the uh, paleontologists who have looked at these fossils, these legs were not just some rudimentary little somethings. These were actually uh, strong enough so that this snake could have walked. And that validates, by the way, the biblical account. Now, the evolutionists and uh, various professors of archaeology have been uh, abounding with their thoughts on how the snake lost its legs. But we know, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> you know, to the, uh, to the uh, secular archaeologist, this whole thing is a riddle. In fact, the, the name of this snake that, in Latin is Pachyrochal Problematicus. <laughs> it is indeed a Problematicus for them because they don't want to believe that the snake ever had legs. Yeah, the Problematical Legged Snake. That's right. Translation of that. <laughs> I, I suppose that's Latin. I don't know. It, I think it is. Now, here's another interesting. This, to me, is one of the very uh, unique, um, amazing stories to come out of this century. Albert Einstein came up with his theory, E equals MC square, by doing a rabbinical study on the word light in Genesis chapter 1. Mm. Gary, this is most fascinating. And J.R., the study of light, uh, and we've devoted, by the way, a, a very long studies of this uh, in, in our magazine, Prophecy in the News, and we don't have time to touch but upon but just a few details today. Uh, when you read in Genesis 1-3, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. In the Hebrew, um, you read uh, where God said, mahi or. Now, in simple terms, what he was saying uh, was something like, me become light. Uh, when he said, let there be light, he was saying, me be light. In other words, he was extending part of himself out. And, uh, and he projected that divine light called or. Now, there's another kind of light in the Bible yes. called ma'or. Let's talk about the, the or for just a moment. That was yeah. the primeval light, the right? The primeval light. Which lit the earth uh, for the first three days yeah. because it was on the fourth day that God made the two great lights that rule the day and the night. And they are of a different Hebrew origin. It's a different word different for light. Word. There's different yeah, they're called, where his light is called or, uh, the lights that we see incandescent, the light of the sun, moon, stars are called ma'or which is a different kind of light. Now, uh, when you take or and ma'or, uh, you have a, a combination of Hebrew letters. And J.R., this is where the story gets interesting. Now, according to the article we have quoted from, Einstein took the word for light, ma'or, and by a complex series of grammatical divisions and substitutions, arrived at the words for ma, or mass, and or, light, for speed, and mahar, raised, and room, uh, uh, for uh, raised, and squared, riba, and uh, finally came up with E equals MC square. <laughs> fascinating, wasn't it? it? Very fascinating. There are a number of, uh, of uh, Hebrew rabbinic scholars today who contend that Einstein derived his basic thoughts, now, while he concluded these mathematically, his basic thinking came from the Hebrew words for the light of God and the light of the sun, moon, and stars in a complex uh, grammatical pattern with the Hebrew alphabet. That's what started him on his trail toward his discovery that E equals MC squared. That's amazing. Yes. And he shared these thoughts with a group of rabbis in New York City, though it is not written in any historical documents that that's where he discovered E equals MC squared. Mm. Now, Gary, the fascinating thing about this is that 
even though we uh, in uh, Christian scholarship uh, do not uh, study the Bible from that perspective. It is a bona fide, accepted method for the rabbis to study the scriptures. And so he did not violate any hermeneutics, so mm. to speak, when he did this. Well, it's fascinating. When we return, we'll be looking at three other amazing discoveries. Don't go away. From our April year 2002 magazine, Amazing Discoveries. I've got an article entitled, The Great Pyramid Survived Noah's Flood. Gary, this is one of the interesting things because I had never really considered the pyramid to, to be pre-flood. Mm -hmm. And yet, according to, uh, according to the uh, article that I found, when Abdullah al-Mamun, son of the Caliph of Baghdad, broke into the Great Pyramid in the year A.D. 820. He found that the walls and floors inside were encrusted with ocean salt as much as an inch thick. Mm. And the casing stones around the outside of the pyramid showed watermarks reaching up more than halfway up the sides of the nearly 500 foot tall monument and silt sediments 14 feet deep around the base of the pyramid contained many seashells and marine articles. Gary, there's no other way to uh, explain it except mm -hmm. that the Great Pyramid went through Noah's flood. Absolutely, and uh, Rutherford's book on the Great Pyramid uh, substantiates this. You know, salt was so valuable to the Arabs that they immediately mined all the salt out of the pyramid. They took that off the walls. And, but today, uh, you can still go into the Queen's Chamber and in the, the little crevices between stones, you can find salt crystals that are left there. No way for them to, to have gotten there unless that pyramid had been immersed. In fact, the pyramid has been shut down until recently uh, for, I guess, over a year. Mm -hmm. While the Egyptians and the French went in and cleaned off the salt Indeed. out of the pyramid, uh, claiming that... Uh, they were going to air condition it, and they are now limiting the number of, uh, of tourists that can go into the Great Pyramid. And J.R. the Sphinx, which is considered to be as ancient as the pyramid, uh, also shows signs of weathering that could only have come from great quantities of water eroding those stones. Uh, there's literally no doubt now that both the pyramid and the Sphinx were both immersed. Now, J.R., in historical times, and this goes all the way back to the time of the pharaohs, Egypt has been dry, 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 very desert-like. So where'd all that water come from? Unless it be the flood of Noah. Hmm. And so, uh, to me, that's a fascinating discovery. Now, let's go to another one. A couple of biochemists of um, uh, Berkeley mm -hmm. University yes. discovered the mitochondrial DNA to be the same in every human being. Now this is a DNA strand that is outside the nucleus, inside the, the cell of a human. And this particular mitochondrial DNA, uh, according to them, uh, creates the way the uh, cell divides. It, it uh, sort of watches over and uh, um, sets up the pattern by which the cell divides. Now the interesting thing about it is this mitochondrial DNA is only supplied by the mother. And in every human being, it is the same DNA. It does not modify. And in this article, which we have in our, uh, let's see, this would be the April 2002 Prophecy in the News, uh, two scientists from Berkeley, Vincent Sarek and Alan Wilson, literally <clears throat> made the statement that uh, uh, that mitochondrial DNA came from one woman, and they said, well, let's just call her Eve. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I wonder where they got that idea. In other words, every human being has come from the same mother. Forget the Peking man, the Neanderthal man, the, the Piltdown man. Uh, just, just throw those out. There is really no such thing as evolution. We all, uh, no matter what a race 
around this world, we are all of the same species. We all come from the same mother. And you know, this is fascinating because when we go back to the days of the flood and uh, the words uh, uh, of the Lord, we find, find in Genesis 6, 8, but Noah uh, found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. Uh, that word or that phrase in the Hebrew, J.R., perfect in his generations, means genealogy. He was perfect in his bloodline. It had not been corrupted since the creation of Adam and Eve, and therefore he was saved. Now, he brought that, shall we say, mitochondrial DNA right across the flood into our era. Uh, there was a television program recently uh, called The Real Eve, where they tried to follow the migration of the human race uh, f from um, uh, Africa, across Arabia and uh, India, and then out into the Philippines, all the way over to Australia. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing they did prove is that we all come from the same mother. Now, of course, the evolutionists would say that our mother is, oh, what, a couple of million, three million maybe years old. Mm -hmm. um, some have said a couple of hundred thousand years old at least. But the truth of the matter is we all come from the same mother. and. Um, if you were to take the present population and work its way back, there's no way the human race could be over about 6,000 years old. That's correct. Now, Eve's uh, name, by the way, it's kind of an interesting uh, gra grammatical oddity that uh, her name in Hebrew is Chava. Uh, Chava, spelled with that uh, chet sound that's so hard for English speakers to make. A and that uh, her name means life. That is, she is... Uh, it's life with the, with the hey ending, which is a feminine ending. So we might call, in, in, in the, the Hebrew, her name means the feminine of the word life. Well, this mitochondrial DNA just absolutely goes uh, lockstep with that idea. She is the life, which is in all of us. Which means, of course, we were created if we did not evolve. If, if we hadn't the basic already. The basic bottom line is that. We, uh, we did not evolve, and I think that, that J.R., as you know, genetic science develops, and sometimes we're a little bit afraid of it, we're afraid of the way it's going, uh, we uh, uh, might be a little worried about genetics, but hey, genetics also prove the Bible. We have another amazing discovery for you, by the way, and this one is of particular interest to me. When the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, there were 18 fragments that were published as unidentified. Jose O'Callaghan of Barcelona, Spain, went through these very carefully, and through a, uh, through a lot of trial and error, he was finally able to find that this particular fragment comes from the Gospel of Mark. It's, and the reason he knows is that this Nu Nu Eta Sigma right here comes from one of the few place names in Greek that uh, can be found, and that would be Gennesaret, the lake of Gennesaret, or mm -hmm. what we'd call Galilee. Mm -hmm. And he proved beyond a shadow of a doubt, Gary, that this particular fragment found in the caves of Qumran, dating back to the first century, is the Gospel of Mark. Not much of a fragment there, but it, it works out perfectly with these letters and the chi uh, right here, the kappa, alpha, iota, and uh, the eta down here, and the other letters. What few letters there are fits mm -hmm. the Gospel of Mark, and only the Gospel of Mark, perfectly. As a matter of fact, Greek orthography, that is the Greek of the New Testament, orthography being the study of the way it was, it was penned, and line layout, line length, and so forth, uh, dictates that when you look at a page in a Greek scroll, it's always going to be laid out much the same way. And in this way, Dr. O'Callaghan literally was able to superimpose 
a perfect text over the discovered text. And J.R., this came from the Dead Sea Scrolls yes. treasure house. Yes. Now, this proves two things in particular. First of all, the scholars at Qumran were hiding New Testament along with Old Testament fragments. Mm -hmm. Even though Israel would like for this to go away, there's no way it's going to go away. It's there. Yes. And secondly, uh, liberal Christian scholars have said that the Gospel of Mark was written around oh, at least the second, third, fourth century, mm -hmm. and uh, there's nothing in it original. But that's not true. It's there for all to see. Well, we'll be back in just a moment.